this uh, oil market needs an ice bath, uh, given that uh, it seems to be on a tear. Uh, let's kick off this morning with Matt Stanley sitting in Dubai, of course, director of Star Fuels. Matt, we seem to have two conflicting narratives this morning. Uh, one is China's slowdown seems to be betting more, more becoming more overt, more, uh, more data backing it up. And at the same token, massive inventory draw in the U.S. pushing markets higher. Your thoughts on this uh, sort of battle of these two forces? Yeah, morning, Sean. Yeah, look, it's been the year of oxymorons, isn't it? It was supposed to be the year of recovery. And it, it, we've, we've seen a remarkable recovery from this time last year. But if you stick on China just for a moment, you know, refinery, refinery output last month was at a 15-month low since April last year. So things have certainly dented and the, the market was always focused on China data as the bellwether of where economies are, how they're looking, how global recovery and global demand is looking. But if you look at the wood for the trees, it's still 8% higher than it was this time last year. So everything has got to be put into context. And we're getting to the point now in the recovery cycle where you can look at pandemic charts on how we were, how we were compared to this time last year. It's a sad state of affairs. I don't think anyone thought that we would be in this position that we are in. Obviously, it's patchy, depending on where you're sitting. If you're sitting in Malaysia and you can't go anywhere, then it's a much different dynamic than where I'm sitting here in Dubai with you know yourself and Andy and Russ in Switzerland, where it's, it's quite free to move around. But uh, yeah, it's the year of oxymorons and the year of um, the recovery looking ever more fractured. Well, I suppose one benefit is, is maybe not the year of the morons, but the year of the oxymorons. We're all uh, here. We're all here. <laughs> They're all in this virtual room together. Uh, Andy Laven, Chief Operating Officer at Sahara Energy Resources. Should the market really be surprised of a big draw in U.S. inventories this week after what happened with Ida the last few weeks, knocking out such massive production. I mean, it seems to be news should be something that surprises. This doesn't feel like a surprise. No, it, it shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, if, if there's any surprise, it's the fact that so much um, of the production went down and then we've got another storm coming on the back of it. So it looks as if it's going to stick around for a while in terms of a lack of supply in, in the U.S., but realistically, it shouldn't be a surprise. It's that time of year. Um, I, I personally don't buy into the idea that you were talking about yesterday around whether it's going to get worse and worse and worse. I think the reality is weather goes through cycles anyway, and technology will get stronger and stronger faster, I believe, than, than the weather gets worse. So I, I think it's just, it's just one of those years. Rustin Edwards, Head of Fuel Oil Procurement at Euronav. Uh, welcome back, Rustin. It, it seems in some ways we've moved from demand sensitive, i.e. China weakness, uh, to supply concerns and, and the drawdown in inventories. And what seemed like a, a, an oversupplied market suddenly feels like, oh, actually, supply is looking a little thin, a little tight. Well, I mean, back to the you know, U.S. Gulf Coast where the major supply disruptions are sitting. Yes, there's, there's currently around 780,000 barrels per day of production that's offline. It's about 39% of the U.S. Gulf Coast offshore production. But that's coupled with about 820,000 barrels a day of refining capacity that's offline. So net net from a macro supply perspective, you've got you know, more production, more refining production offline than you have from crude production offline. Therefore, you could see crude stocks not draw as hard as the API shows, but dis the product stocks could still draw. Um, but it net net from a macro level, it's a balanced market in that regard. So, um, Hurricane Nicholas went ashore, did really nothing. It rained hard in Houston, rained hard in uh, it's raining hard in Louisiana, north of Baton Rouge. Um, no shut ins happened because of Nicholas, no refineries shut down because of Nicholas. Everybody kept their plants running, maybe at a lower rate, but for the most part, uh, refining sector looks like it's okay. Matt, given these dislocations these that we're seeing in the market at the moment, we saw obviously we have LNG on the gas side at this massive high level. What is that disrupting, dislocating? We've got Ida and now another hurricane coming on the back of it into the Gulf of Mexico, disrupting exports out of the U.S. I mean, how do you see these dislocations playing out and impacting each other? 
Well, I mean, on the LNG story, I mean, it, it, just sorry, just on the hurricanes, it's a seasonal yeah. thing. It's, um, uh, you know, we had Laura and Marco last year, which wiped out similar areas in terms of production and refining. Uh, as Russ said, which the market seems to ignore, the, refi- the return of refineries is not as quick as many uh, were hoping. And that, that, you know, there's still supply offline, but, you know, demand from the refining sectors hasn't caught up yet. So it's a welcome distraction for the market um, on crude flat price for the immediate short term. On LNG, LNG is really the inter- real interesting story this year um, if for two reasons. One is obviously Greta, because we can't have an energy story without Greta Thunberg these days. You've got to meet her. You've got to meet her. It's starting to feel like stalking. I'm not sure it's legal. She's still under 18. I don't meet your heroes, Sean, or your (laughs) others. Um, No, it's 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 an interesting one because LNG has become so expensive. So when you've got the likes of Bangladesh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, um, Pakistan, and they they've all been using LNG in recent years for power generation or air conditioning, it's two hundred dollars a ton higher than fuel oil. So what it's happened is, what do you do? If you're, if you're a, a power generating company that needs to import feedstocks for air conditioning, you you go with the cheapest source and China are doing the same regarding coal. So it, it's played a real, a real hand in the fuel oil market because demand for high sulfur fuel oil has really gone through the roof um, and it's heavily backwardated. And, you know, I've been exceptionally busy, um, but it's also the, the long-term argument regarding Carbon emissions, you know, it, it, is, if LNG is such a fragile feedstock because it's so expensive at the moment, what is the alternative? And the alternative at the moment is, is higher carbon producing uh, feedstocks and, um, and what, what they burn in those, in those units. So LNG is really one that the market is going to watch uh, closer than anything else because it's affecting other parts of the oil barrel. So it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic that we're in. Andy, your thoughts on that dynamic, given this sort of China slowdown, we're seeing China data overnight that the throughput in uh, Chinese refineries, the lowest in, since May 2020, uh, a significant shift uh, down for them, where that goes versus the sort of supply tightness we're seeing in, in, in the US and elsewhere. So, so I personally don't think China is something we should be worrying about. China plays the long game. They're not ones to kind of whipsaw, like, for example, you can see happening in the shale. They are looking at where they're going in 10, 20 years' time, and and it's the long haul that they're in. So to me, all the short-term perturbations that you see coming out of China in terms of when they release from their SPR or they do this or they do that, Everything's all about the long term. And I think actually that gives the the global economy quite a good solid base. And I do think we've, to come back on what Matt said, I think we've possibly overused China as being something that is really something we should be watching. But it, it, it is it is the key and has been and coming into the winter, it is the sort of key uh, source of, um, you know, incremental demand growth. And, and if it's 5% GDP on the year or 10, that's a huge difference. Yeah. So, so short term, what they do has an impact. But I think we need to be wary of saying, therefore, actually, China's in a basket case and yes. to fall off the cliff. Right. They will do things in the short term that suit them, but it's all in the, the search of getting it right in the long term. So yeah, short term, there are always going to be changes that will probably surprise us because they're not running their economy the way the rest of the world runs it. Yeah, well, there certainly seem to be, as we've heard from our Chinese commentators, uh, willing to compromise uh, short-term economic growth for structural shift for long-term direction. And that seems to be the window that we're in at the moment. The, the, as somebody said to me not so long ago, we all have to get ready for China growing at 3%, just like any other mature economy uh, outside of this extraordinary window uh, of COVID. But the 2 to 3% growth for mature economy, China is on its way there uh, and everything has to build around that. The, the 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 other thing I wanted just to get some views on uh, Rustin is is the Baltic 
index, which does appear to be on the move uh, up at uh, 4, 2 to 1, up nearly 1.5% today. What does the Baltic Dry Index tell us as it reaches these heights? That uh, inflation is not going to be transitory. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. As we um, see uh, reports out of the UK overnight, you know, 3.5% uh, inflation rate. Yeah, four and a half percent in the United, or five and a half percent in the United States, or five point four in the United States. Oh, I'll get my numbers in the right order. Yeah. Um, but um, nevertheless, it just shows that container rates are going to continue to remain strong. Uh, but I, I think that they're probably hitting the top end of the curve. Uh, you have had this meteoric rise; it's moved up to a point. You now have major shipping companies announcing that they're not going to increase rates further. They're going to try to put a cap on it because they're making so much money. They have no idea what to do with all the cash once they get it. Um, you know, you can only build so many new ships and you can only do uh, so much other improvements around your old ships. So um, I think they're also trying to- I, I've heard them. reports of, I've heard reports of uh, dry bulk ships being converted in for taking containers because the opportunity of the price of containers now uh, at, at four or five times X. Is that they can basically double their rate haul on the ship by putting containers on board. Now, wow. dry bulk can put containers inside the hold of the dry bulk ship because most of these ships are designed sometimes to carry containers. Uh, Golden Ocean got, has gotten class approval for some of their larger ships to do this. And, you know, they can put, uh, you know, 7,000 boxes on and away they go and they can make uh, three times their uh, charter higher on the voyage. So they're more than happy to do it. And that's kind of how you can tell that we're coming to the end of the container freight bubbles that you have, you know, markets are efficient. People are figuring out other ways to move boxes outside of just a normal container ship, which is just going to spread that out. And it's actually going to start capping the market. So I think we're probably at the high end. We're probably at the top and it's probably going to start uh, easing down, but it's still going to be elevated in relation to calendar 2020 prices going into 2022 and probably into Q2 is when it starts to flatten out again. Russ, can I just ask a question, Sean? Sorry, just Please, on yeah. that, because that's a real, it's a real um, talking point. The issue doesn't seem to be the ships themselves, though. Isn't it the issue regarding, say, crew change, um, it, bottlenecks, the, the discharge and load port? It's all, it's all port bottleneck at this point. And what drives the uh, freight demand is you get people... Uh, who try to jump the queue, you know, a bun bunch of boxes waiting to get on a boat. Somebody really wants to move their container. They pay up to get their container to the front of the queue. And yeah. so shipping companies are happy to take that increased rate. But again, those goods shipped in that container now have a higher inlaid cost because the freight is four or five times what they normally would be paying under a contract rate. Sounds like what I try to do at all airports, pay for that extra golden pass queue on security. So I don't have to take my shoes off. Um, Looking at the price, Matt, I'm not quite sure at the moment if you're a bear or a bull. I mean, bear, you've always been. Uh, where are you at at the moment? I, I think the world needs to know. We're seeing oil prices Brent up ten dollars uh, in in the last month since August twentieth, uh, and on that upward trajectory, we have our resident bear Omar, our bull Omar Najia, saying, "You know, hold on to your shorts. We're going up to eighty and above." Where am I at the moment? If I yeah. had a pack for every time I ask, ask myself that question, Sean, I'd be a millionaire, mate. Don't worry. Well, give me an argument as to why you could still be a bear in this market. Um, I, I don't. Dem the demand forecast can has been kicked down the road since January, right? Mm -hmm. Second half was supposed to be the return with a vengeance of mm -hmm. driving jet fuel. Yeah, yeah. Now, the jet fuel rhetoric is an interesting one because, okay, in the grand scheme of things, the jet pool isn't that big. Um, it's about 10% of oil demand, still 10 million barrels a day. And we're only about 6 million barrels a day back. So that's still 4% down. That's in the short term. I think it, the one thing that the market needs to consider right now, we're in a supply deficit right now, right? More oil is coming back and there will be a hell of a lot more oil come May 2022. I think that that is, if demand does not come back in terms of international travel, then I, we're going to be in a supply deficit. And a majority of economists, including Ed at Emirates MBD, he sees that as an issue that is waiting to be addressed. Is the second half next year when demand hasn't caught up and there's a lot more oil back. Iran is a separate discussion. I don't see that happening anytime soon. And even if they come to an agreement, it won't be until Q3 next year that we'll see more oil back from them. On long term, though, and this is really what the, the conversation has, has, has 
the launch has been from COVID is the, again, Greta, we come back to that blessed Swedish person, um, is that the investment in the oil patch simply isn't there. It's not there. And I, whether we like it or not, we all use and need oil and we will for the foreseeable future. Electricity, electric cars have taken away around about 50,000 barrels a day of oil consumption, which is nothing, nothing. And about $10 trillion in stock market valuations. Well, yeah, all, all, all based off Twitter. Amazing, yeah, really. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, look, short term, I think the market will be support, supported through Q4. I know Mike was exceptionally bullish on Sunday regarding China, that he sees all that being pulled out. I don't know where the SPR sale fits in with that argument. That, so that will be interesting to how... Well, he's a big believer out. in replenishing there. But Andy, is it the surprise of the year, really, that we're going into the fourth quarter and it's a story about supply tightness and not a demand resurgence? I mean, Sarah Akbar earlier in the week as well, sort of screaming sirens about this is a lot tighter. Don't think that OPEC plus has a lot of idle barrels it can bring back in short order. I think it's just a figment of how the human mind works. We kind of focus on one thing and then get surprised when something else happens. So then we look at that and then get surprised again. I think um, I was listening to what Matt and you were talking about. And for me, I kind of go back to, gosh, several years ago, Ali Naimi said that the, for, the best thing for OPEC is to have very low prices because then nobody else is going to produce the oil. Well, realistically, if you look out over the next five, 10 years, Global warming, Greta Thunberg, et cetera, et cetera, is playing into exactly that game from a very different perspective. Everybody in the developing world is going to start moving investment elsewhere, and the OPEC producers will not. So, so we are going to, we, we're entering a very, very different beast in terms of the dynamics of supply and demand, in terms of where the supply comes from and then demand is. And we are not going to move away from requiring oil as quickly, I don't believe, as the major international oil companies will move away from oil investment. So we are going to see some supply shortages, and I think we'll see it quicker rather than later. The, the, there certain, well, we saw last month uh, OPEC plus not even being able to meet their own fairly measly 400,000 barrel a day increase. So even within OPEC plus, there seems to be a, an inability to, to reach the quotas that they've set for themselves. Uh, let, just moving to the consumer price index that came out yesterday, uh, Rustin, I'm sort of curious as to your views. The, the, the US economy appears to be the heat at least is coming out of it. Are we seeing that reflected in any way on the, the sort of infamous China to West Coast America to shipping routes, the prices of that whole sort of backlog and bottleneck there, or does it look still red hot? It still looks hot. Um, I mean, you know, the CPI was expected to be at 5.5. It came in at 5.4 and people were cheering. Oh, it's not as hot as analysts expected. Right. You know, point 0.1 is still, you know, it's not mean meaningful in my mind because Price of food is up. I mean, if you look at the yeah. price of beef in the United States, beef is usually the cheapest meat you can have. It's up 18, 19% Q on Q. Uh, price of chicken, price of pork, all up. Um, so you know, your food cost is all going to increase. Why is that happening? Because, oh, the price of LNG is so expensive, which is increasing on the price of grain, which is used to feed these animals. Um, so the transitory nature, nature of the inflation is not there. It is more getting in further and further embedded into the day-to-day -day goods and services that people need to buy and to survive and to keep moving. Um, you, wonder, you wonder if the narrative is such, you know, we're a week out from the next, not even a week to the next Fed meeting. 21st, you know, 22nd. Sir, <laughs> huh? 21st, 22nd. Yeah. And, and it looks nearly like, the, you know, you can spin these numbers, which are still very big. 5.3%, uh, you know, is, is a big number on the CPI, but less than expected. It sort of sets the Fed up to be able to sort of do another pass. Well, it, it might, but you still have a tremendous amount of slack on the employment side. I mean, so you still have a lot of people who are looking to come back to work. And I'm reading more and more articles of companies increasing wages 
to get people back. I mean, so you've got uh, Sam's Club, which is the Walmart big box distributor um, um, in the United States, that they're going to increase wages by 15, 20% to get people back into the stores or uh, employees back in the stores, not the people shopping, but cash registers, restock boys, whatever. Amazon's moving their dollar hourly rate from 15 uh, to 18 dollars an hour. And, and if you, you know, put that rate over all the goods that you buy and sell throughout that system, that's an increase in cost for the end consumer. So, you know, as wages start to come up, that whole supply chain cost structure goes up and it just maintains it. So it doesn't become, it's not transitory at all. It becomes embedded in the economy. Which point. is exactly why I agree with you on the Baltic index. Got to keep an eye on that to get a sense that this is not transitory. I think we're being sold you know, pie in the sky by Fed on that. Uh, let's go to the survey question and give everybody in the room a chance to uh, have a brief on this idea. In the tug of war of, for the direction of oil price, who wins between 1A stock draws or China slowdown? China slowdown, you think, would bring the price down. Stock draws, obviously pushing it up. Who's win who will win on this tug of war as we move forward? Uh, certainly today, it looks like stock draws. Um, well, you got to remember that the price increase that we've seen here is all due to supply disruption. Mexico, Ida, you know, proceed from Nicholas, which is now gone, Libyan strikes. There, 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 there is clearly, I know, the one that never gets, obviously, the, the OPEC plus uh, uh, that is still, I think, struggling to meet these quotas. Uh, and, and Matt, on that point, OPEC plus, they came out with their report this week. Uh, uh, earlier in the week uh, with a big 6 million, uh, held, hold on to 6 million for 21 and, and a big number four, over 4 million demand recovery again next year. Your thoughts on those numbers out of OPEC Plus? Well, it's not safe for radio, but um, it's. It, I'd like to know where they get those numbers from. Um, look, I said in my commentary yesterday, they can't downplay the very thing that they are there to protect. Uh, they have to be bullish. It's within their nature, as does any oil trader. The, the momentum this year on oil prices, well, since the end of October, has been extraordinary. We've only been on an upward path. We've seen the occasional bump and hiccup, but that's to be expected in, in you know, nature of markets. It's, again, I mentioned this point, it's who is investing in the market. It's, you know, it's Oil, is, uh, the funds have really come in this year and oil has given them a, a significant return. Um, it's all on the back of a demand rhetoric that was forecast for this year. And I, I can't imagine that there's a, an energy agency that are constantly, they're constantly downgrading their prompt demand forecasts, but increasing them for three months later. So it's, oh, okay, that, that didn't work out how we were hoped, um, but don't worry. Things will be good in three months. And we've heard that for the last year. And eventually reality has to, has to kick in. And I think it has. We've been range bound really since April around between 65 and 75. Um, I think that that will continue. It just, with more and more oil coming back and, you know, the US are back to, okay, forget Ida. She knocked out uh, one and a half million barrels a day. That's, that's to be expected. We, we, U.S. oil production is scheduled in October to be the highest for 18 months. Flat price continues to stay up here. The more, the more that the big, share, no, the shareholders of places like Chevron or um, Continental, whoever it might be, they are going to start putting their hands in their pockets and they're going to start drilling again. We won't get up. I don't think we'll get up to the 13 and a half million barrels. But I wouldn't be surprised if in six months we see another half million barrels back from the U.S. So. Eventually, high prices that have been supported by funds will translate into some tangible uh, wells being drilled in the US, which just adds to the long-term argument about where we're going on the supply-demand balance. We've got uh, Brent trading a little over 74. We're essentially that the high uh, that got, came in in July, uh, 76, 72, Andy. Are we going to get back there? We would also acknowledge just from the point of view of that longer-term demand recovery you know korea now also reporting record employment the unemployment rate in uh, korea has fallen to its lowest on record lowest not this year on record uh, south korea one of the biggest economies in the world 
No, I think the the issue for oil is is two things. One is the short term actions that that you've been talking about, and Matt and Russ have been talking about. And then there's but what happens in the future? What could happen, right? So jet is a small portion of the barrel, but what you can see happening today is domestic jet demand is hitting the roof in a lot of places compared to what it's been over the last year, where the real problem is, is international travel. So you've got a lot of pent up demand sitting there. But if the world suddenly says, actually, now you can start traveling if you're vaccinated, suddenly stuff can take off. And I think that's the bit that's going to potentially push us out of where we are today is that something happens and everybody starts, oh, fine, now, now we can start moving. Now we can start traveling. Now we can start doing this. And demand is then going to take off. And then we'll have a problem pulling the supply for the demand. Andy, it's just it's, on that, sorry. Just sorry, yeah. Sean. Um, I thought a significant headline this morning was that Qantas um, are going to take bookings from December to start traveling to London and Singapore and to Dubai. I mean, that Antipodean route is so important for the long haul travel. Of course it is. And okay, domestic demand for jet is good, but the airlines don't make money going from Perth to Canberra. They make money going from Perth to Heathrow, right? So I think that that's a significant shift. If if we see Singapore, Oz and New Zealand open up their borders, I think that that will really set a precedent for international travel to come roaring back, as you say. Well, yeah, it does. I, my, my only point against that argument is the fact that you've got... That numerous... Australians shouldn't be allowed to travel anytime. I mean, that's like... Well, given, let's right? not get into that one. Um, <laughs> wow. Once we've agreed on that, go. Um, it, it's the fact that, uh, you know, if you look at companies putting out their ESG requirements, I mean, just recently here in Switzerland, Zurich Bank said they're going to cut business travel by 77%. And that's a theme that's being put into a lot of companies right now because they're all looking at their ESG requirements, they're all looking at their emissions footprints, and they're also looking at the associated risk of having a someone on a business trip coming down with COVID, getting hospitalized and potentially dying. And all of that is an inherent risk to a company putting employees on a plane, going on a voyage somewhere. So I think you know it's great that these announcements happen and things happen, but how much of the real the real money that airlines make comes from the business traveler. How many companies are going to let their employees hop on a plane, fly to Singapore for a week to do business trips when everybody's been doing the face-to-face -face over Skype and over uh, uh, Zoom for the last year and a half? I mean, I think it's really that change in dynamic on the business traveler is something people are not taking into consideration. If you look at the U.S. numbers right now, they're averaging about 500,000 less passengers per day than in 2019. And that's with the roaring domestic demand in the United States. Yeah, it seems people are more than happy to go to spend a, a, a football match with 60,000 people in London or in, uh, as I was watching last night, in uh, Bern in, in uh, Switzerland, where Manchester United lost 2-1. It was terrible. But at least Ronaldo's scoring goals, that's always fun. Uh, but it does seem that uh, that long-haul piece is questionable uh, and we're, we'll be very interested to see how it plays out in the coming weeks here in Dubai, of course, big business conference destination and tourist destination, and most of that is long haul. I think the big data point to watch going forward is vaccine rates in Asia. Where they go, I think the oil price goes in the coming period, uh, and uh, maybe everything else for that matter. But if vaccine rates in Vietnam and Philippines, of course, in China and India, massive, uh, massive to their recovery. Um, but that's a wrap. Let's just get the survey result. I don't think we got it in yet. Stock draws. Who wins? Stock draws. Trump, China slowdown. Uh, I, I think I probably agree with that. China slowdown feels like a narrative that's already bedded into the oil price, whereas stock draws is uh, something that is happening every week. Uh, much of you will be delighted to hear that next week we will have a guest host. I will not be in the chair uh, some of us have to celebrate 20th anniversaries. It's just a requirement. You've got to do it or they don't. You don't get a 21st one. So uh, <laughs> that's that's the crack. And uh, stepping into the hot chair, Vanda Harry, founder and CEO of Vanda Insight. So uh, that will be fun. Anyway, tomorrow we'll be back same time, 10.30 UAE time. Thanks, uh, Rustin. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Andy. See you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good day.